So the title of this talk is the same as the title of the paper that this talk is inspired by. Um, can a fruit fly learn word embeddings? And displayed here are pictures of all of the authors involved on that paper. I'm Ben Hoover. Um, I want to give a particular shout out to Yu Chen Liang, the first author of this paper, and Dima Krotov, who actually I think was able to join this call. So we have an additional expert to answer questions as you guys might have them. Um, but as you can see, this is a collaboration across a lot of different companies, a lot of different institutions. Um, and people get really interested in this kind of thing, and I think for different reasons. So let's talk a little bit about um, why we even started this project in the first place. Um, so when Yu Chen was an intern at IBM, he worked with uh, Dima, and they wanted to, they, to tackle this question, right? Can we, can we hack biological algorithms to solve useful tasks in AI? Um, so they brainstormed for a bit, eventually settled on finding some application in natural language processing. Um, but then all these other authors started flocking in, and each of them have their own expertise, their own experience. And, and one of the reasons that this is so interesting is this is a biologically inspired model. Um, so the biological inspiration, how we can incorporate that into artificial intelligence is really attractive and appealing and novel. Um, there's not a lot of work in the field compared to in other areas. Um, because it's inspired by nature, which has had hundreds of thousands, millions of years to optimize this architecture for intelligence, it's actually a really computationally efficient model, um, algorithm. Um, and then the role that's near and dear to my heart as a visualization and an interpretability engineer is the interpretability aspect, the inherent interpretability of this model. So we'll spend a bit of time um, talking about each of these bullet points. Um, uh, this, this next slide, I think you're going to see this picture a lot um, coming up in the next few slides. So we're going to get familiar with it over the course of this talk. Um, but the algorithm that we used is based on one of the best studied systems in neuroscience, which is the mushroom body um, network in the fruit fly's brain. Um, to describe a little bit of what you guys see here, every single circle represents a cell. Um, and cells either fire or they don't. They're either on or they're off. So we can view each of these cells as either in an on or off state, or as this is kind of a binary system. Um, the input is the bottom, and the input is composed of three different sensory modalities um, for the fruit fly. So we can look at the olfaction, so the sense of smell of the fruit fly, the thermohydrosensory system, or how well can it sense temperature, humidity, and vision, right? So these are just standard inputs into the, the life of a fruit fly. Um, these are synaptically connected to a network of Ken Kenyan cells, represented by the green circles. Um, these are the cells that learn how to associate inputs. Um, and we'll talk more about that as well. And then the very interesting cell, a singular cell that has a very important purpose in uh, the intelligence of a fruit fly is the APL neuron, the anterior paired lateral neuron. Um, its role is to be excited by the Kenyan cells and then in turn inhibit certain Kenyan cells from firing. Um, this helps us develop very sparse hash codes of different inputs. Um, so let's talk, I guess, a little bit more about what this input looks like in the realm of natural language processing. Um, for those of you familiar uh, with natural language processing, with speech in general, you might find this humorous um, and also insightful. Said by John Rupert Firth in 1957, he said, a word is characterized by the company it keeps. Um, in other words, uh, the meaning of a word is determined as much by what that word is as the context that's around it. Um, so we can encode, uh, in traditional senses, we can encode, excuse me, a uh, bag of words kind of model um, where, say, we have a chunk of text. In this case, the example would be Apple stock rises on optimism for the new iPhone. Um, let's highlight the bag of words that Apple stock rises. So we'll call this a three gram. Um, it can be of any odd length W. Um, so we'll call it a three gram. Um, and the word that we care about is the word that's in the middle. So stock, um, we'll call that the target word. And then everything around it is its context. In this case, Apple and rises. So the question is, how do we encode this in some system that can be represented and passed to the mushroom body that we talked about earlier? One thing we can do is we can treat the context of every target word, so the words immediately around stock, as a separate modality from the target word itself. Um, and you can concatenate these, just like is shown in the picture, into a context compartment and a target compartment of a single vector. Um, each dimension of this vector in the context uh, represents a single word. In this case, apple and rises are present in the context, therefore they're represented by a one, um, but they're not present in the target. A target only ever has one uh, word encoded, so that's that's uh, entirely binary, entirely zero except for the target word that is there, stock. 
Um, so this is the input into our system. It, it matches the idea that there are cells that are fired um, before passing them into the Kenyan cell associative memory layer. Um, so I guess the real question is, what do we actually learn in this system? Is it, is it do we learn the cells? Do we learn what? Um, and, and the answer is actually these arrows here that connect the input to the Kenyan cell network. Um, we learn that system of weights. So before you've only seen three arrows, this is actually a very densely connected matrix. Every single input is connected to every single Kenyan cell. That's the assumption we make um, and might also be uh, plausible. So we have the information of every Kenyan cell is connected to every input dimension, um, creating essentially for us computer scientists out there, the concept of a matrix, a synapse matrix, if you will, um, where your number of Kenyan cells is one dimension and the size of your input dimension is another. This is the matrix we learn. Of course, the real question is how do we learn that uh, matrix? And so we'll walk you through very briefly and hopefully intuitively um, the algorithm for learning this matrix, these synapse connections. Um, so because this is, and I'll slow down just a little bit here, um, because this is a biologically inspired algorithm, this means that we don't actually have a loss function that's passed from some, uh, some network layer way in the future. All the information we need to update these synaptic weights are actually present and they're shown um, on the screen. We have the input, um, which we're gonna call V. So this is in the case of the natural language processing, word embedding, a situation we are working with, uh, just the context and the target vector. Um, and then W, which is the synapses from before. Um, this, is, this is all we need to work with to update and, and learn uh, weights for this. So, so one variable that's going to come in handy here is is just this very long temporary variable I'm calling z, um, which is just the dot product between uh, the input and every single uh, synaptic weight leading to a Kenyan cell. Um, so that's that's z, um, and each one kind of corresponds to how much does this Kenyan cell fire when this input is passed, right? So for for every Kenyan cell, we have one scalar representing um, how strongly it fires for the given input. Um, and now here's here's the equation. This is this is the whole gradient that we're working with here. Um, the gradient of our synaptic weights is some learning rate eta, um, some function based on how much each one is firing. I'll talk about that in a second. And then the direction and the magnitude is kind of all determined by this input minus the how much each network is firing broadcasted across the synaptic weights. Um, what this means is essentially if the inputs for, for the largest synaptic weight matching the input, um, we're going to update that to make it look even more like the input. Um, so the, the gradient or the, sorry, not the gradient, the G of Z um, function that I talked about just here is really only going to take one of three values for every Kenyan cell. It's either going to be on which is one, which means we update that value. It's gonna be zero, which means don't touch this one. Um, or it's gonna be this anti-Hebian parameter, which we're just gonna call delta here, um, negative delta. Um, and so that says, I actually want to inhibit this neuron from firing when it detects an input that matches this pattern. Um, so in the end, what we actually have is really with one input, we're typically only updating maybe one or a couple of these synaptic, uh, of these Kenyan cell weights um, in the direction of the input to make it look more like the input, if that's what we have, um, to make it look more like the input, if it is this, the, the Hebbian learning, to make it look less like the input, if, if it is anti-Hebbian, um, but most of them we're just not touching. So the learning algorithm is actually incredibly, incredibly um, efficient in this way. We don't have to update everything for every single input, just the neuron that's firing the most and all the synaptic weights leading into it. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we're only updating the maximally firing neuron in this in this model. And and we really didn't use the anti-Hebbian parameter for learning the word embeddings that we're gonna show you. Um, we really just we really just updated the maximally firing neuron and everything else stayed the same for every input. Um, so yeah, that's that's the that's the learning algorithm. I kind of flew through that. So again, I am an engineer on this project. Uh, this was kind of provided to me and I will struggle through it. Dima has wrestled with this equation and kind of invented it and would love to answer more questions at the end if you guys have some. Um, but I'd like to first talk a little bit about how well this works. Um, so we can go dive into some of the some of the results. And, and the first one here is, is just kind of a human qualitative evaluation of the system. Um, 
On the left, we'll focus on this graph here. Uh, it's actually a scatter plot composed of word pairs. Um, you can see if you look closely, there's words like football, basketball, bread and butter, five month precedent cognition. Um, what essentially happened is on the x-axis, you see this, this label called human annotated similarity. Humans actually came through and on a scale of zero to 10 labeled how similar the two, the word pair is to each other. Um, and then we have our model, which again, creates a binary hash code of every single word. Um, and we, we see the similarity between the words in the hash code space compared to the human annotated similarity space and kind of plot a correlation and so what you see is that the model thinks that tiger and tiger, which are indeed the same word, are 51 out of 51 um, in a hash length of 51 uh, word embedding. So let me let me just zoom out just a little bit here again. Um, what we did here is we have 400 Kenyan cells. Um, for every word, we set only 51 of these are allowed to fire. And remember I said cells are either on or they're off. Um, in this case, the Kenyan cells, there are 51 Kenyan cells that fired for tiger. There are 51 Kenyan cells that fired for tiger and they happen to be the same Kenyan cells. That makes sense. Um, let's take another example, say football and basketball. Um, if you look at the Y axis, there's a, there's a 40. So that means 40 of those 51 that were allowed to fire are the exact same that fired. So this is, these two words are very similar to each other. Let's find words that are very not similar to each other in the binary embedding space um, up an entity, cup, an entity. Um, humans annotated these things as very dissimilar, so did our model. Um, of the 51, it looks like maybe five of them fired uh, that overlapped. Five and month, maybe five of them fired and overlapped. Um, so this shows just there's a correlation between conceptually what we view as similar in word space um, and yeah, we can see the correlation there. On the right, we actually see something called agglomerative clustering. It's, it's a technique used in, to describe the evolutionary tree. Um, and we do that by kind of taking DNA samples from a bunch of different species. Um, we're not taking DNA samples. We're taking essentially the, the word embedding of each of these words that you see at the leaves. So neighborhood streets, neighborhoods on the top left is are these um, leaf nodes. And we have residences, sprawling malls, downtown. This is more. Um, and we find the most, the centroid of that cluster, um, that becomes, rep, rep starts to represent the whole cluster. And as we work our way up, you see that neighborhoods and streets is encompassed by this concept of streets. It's the most centroid of those. Towns, urban, and cities is encompassed by this word urban, which uh, uh, makes sense because you have cities and metropolis and towns, these all represent urban. Residences, malls, flats, apartments, resorts. Um, resorts seems to, uh, be the umbrella word to uh, encompass all of those concepts. And then resorts and metropolis, when you take those together and all the leaf nodes encompassed therein, looks like the most common thing between those two is streets. Uh, resorts and metropolis have streets in common. And you can do the same kind of conceptual following on the right. And so our, our hash code represents some kind of, mm, can makes conceptual sense of what we understand of words. And we have an interactive demo that you guys can play with here in a bit that I'll show you that does something similar to this. Um, so now we have another task, right? And this is the word and context task. And it's, it can be described as follows. Um, you have a pair of sentences now, not a pair of words. Um, and you have the same word in each of these contexts, but they mean sometimes different things. And sometimes they mean the same thing, depending on the words around it. Um, so let's look at the Apple. Apple is the name of a company, design of Apple latest iPhone. And then apple is also a delicious fruit, one of my favorite, filling sweet apple pie recipe. And the question is, what are the nearest neighbor words in the hash code space for the word apple given the context? Well, our model finds words like design, web, features, and graphics when you provide it a context of design of latest iPhone. This makes sense. That's how we kind of think of the, the company apple. But when we start using words like sweet, filling, pie, and recipe, the words most similar to apple are gonna be some kind of delicacy like chocolate or sweet or crispy noodles. Um, and this, this works too for a word like bank. So in English you have bank, which is where you put your money um, so that people don't take it away and maybe it can grow with a small amount of interest. And you have bank, which is the side of a stream or a body of water that flows. 
Um, and when you use bank in the context of money and checking account, your most similar words are money and credit and loans and accounts. And our model is able to find this, um, again, in, in a very sparse and binary space. Um, and then you have boat and river, which, which obviously starts to link to nature concepts like, like islands and creeks and canyons. Um, the task of distinguishing whether these two words are used in the same context or have the same meaning in the two different contexts is shown in the table below. Um, so here we show that BERT, which has historically been an incredible transformer model on, on all of these natural language tasks, 61.2% um, of the time, on average, um, it's able to determine whether the meaning is the same or different. Um, now, because it's a random, you have two choices, the, the worst score you can get is 50 percent of the time, which is a word to vec with zero context and a word to sense with zero context, or essentially randomly guessing at whether those are the same meaning or not. Um, but glove with a window size of seven and word to sense with a window size of seven and word to vec of a window size of five um, are significantly less powerful than ours, which, which takes a larger window size, um, but correctly guesses whether these have the same meaning 57.7 percent of the time on average. So it works here. Um, this is just, I'm not going to go through all the numbers here. There's honestly several of these tasks I'm not super intimate with. Um, but ours is either best or second best and matching a lot of these other binarized uh, hash codes, uh, word embedding, sparse word embeddings. Um, so yeah, we can talk a little bit more about this if you guys are familiar with these tasks. Um, there's the document classification task. Again, Bert is really, really good at this. Um, but incredibly with only, um, bits to represent words, 400 bits to represent a word. Um, ours is second best in the news group task and not far behind glove or word to vec in all the other document classification tasks. Um, and the, I think one of the new things I want to emphasize here, which I said at the beginning, is this is an incredibly efficient algorithm. We trained on a 40 gigabyte corpus and we weren't using more than 267 megabytes of GPU memory um, with smart representation of the inputs and the outputs and the weights. Um, and with really pretty large batch sizes. We're training on three GPUs, takes eight minutes to train an entire word embedding model. So this is incredibly fast model that's even feasible to train on a, on a large core. Yeah, a huge thanks to one of the authors, Leopold Grinberg, who's familiar with high performance computing for implementing this. So yeah, let's huh, actually take some time to go to a demo, but this is, this is a demo I was able to kind of create to explore what was learned by the model, um, what each of the neurons concepts are. Uh, I would like to take my time through this because I am I do enjoy this kind of stuff, this interactive demo, but maybe if people have questions, love to take a few now as I switch. Yeah, I might have one question for you. Um, you you mentioned that uh, during the building of the model, you made a few assumptions. One of them being that the the sensor part of the of the whole model is fully connected to the the canyon layer. I'm I'm just wondering um, what what was the process you used to 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 decide the hypothesis your model was b built on. Okay. Um... So I, I suppose that I, I, it, it'd be a sin to present this talk in a silo. Um, this, this, these experiments on natural language processing were in a large part inspired by work Dima has done before um, on images, on um, other domains. So, so we had made the assumption before, he had made the assumption before and, and proven that it works very well when you have a fully connected uh, synaptic weight between the inputs and the Kenyan cell layer. Um, so we knew this worked and the challenge was then applying it to language and seeing how it builds associations there. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. Um, okay, in that case, maybe one more question. Um, you, you, you spoke about words as being modalities well, I actually we could see words as modalities in, in this model. Um, uh, do, do you think of any way of extending this model so that it can actually perform well on multimodal tasks and uh, yeah, for instance work on both you know, we, we've seen clip with images and and, uh, and words mm -hmm. 
Um, I see Dima has just uh, un silenced his video, so he's ready to talk. But I'll take a quick stab at this real quick. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for the multimodal um, model. There are a lot of modalities that can you can just kind of plug and play in this uh, learning framework and, and kind of go to town on the different applications it can have. Uh, yeah, we've definitely thought about it, and Dima probably has a more complete answer than I. Yeah, may I just quickly add one thing uh, regarding the previous question. So, so essentially, like if you uh, look at FruitFlies, the organization of that matrix W, in FruitFlies it is actually not a dense matrix; it is a sparse matrix, meaning that uh, you know, given Kenyan cell is connected only to a small number of projection units. Now, the truth is that uh, prior to application of our learning algorithm, we assume that this matrix is dense. But once the learning algorithm completes its work, so when all the synaptic connections are learned, that matrix also ends up being extremely sparse. And essentially, like uh, that sparse matrix would be uh, visualized in Ben's uh, demo that he's about to show. So in some sense, it's indeed somewhat uh, similar to like how fruit flies perceive variance of various orders. Okay. Yeah, just one little thing that I wanted to add. No, thanks, Diva. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go through this one just, to, just briefly. Um, so what do we see here? We have uh, an input phrase box. Um, in the realm of fruit flies, you can kind of view this as a novel smell that the fruit fly smells. Um, it already has its learned semantic weights. It's just trying to understand what this new smell means. And it does that by kind of composing the concepts um, in its head, the certain Kenyan cells will fire, and we want to see if those have inherent meaning. Um, so I've selected this, this new smell, and these are the different neurons that fired the most out of all of the Kenyan cells. Um, and this first one fired actually quite a lot, so 38% of all of these activations, uh, the weight is, belongs on this neuron. And it also fires with words like violations and rights and civil freedoms and human abuses and human beings, right? Like there's uh, a concept here that this neuron has strongly learned some concept of rights, human rights. Um, this one over here very strongly has learned the concept of Supreme Court. Basically it's, it's, it's the justice system, which we can see here, there's a European court. Um, another neuron fired a little bit less, but we're starting to see this is, this is different countries. You have the Soviet Union, European, um, you have government, uh, republics, American states. Uh, so this neuron has learned to fire when it's in the presence of some kind of political or, or country uh, input. Um, and then very little, right? The more you, deeper you go, the less sense these might make because we're starting to get to the level of noise. Um, but it also senses things like judges and courts um, and another, another concept of Supreme Courts. Um, so let's try another example, right? A new smell. Um, let's do this one. And this one's interesting for a couple of reasons. One is I think it composes several very distinct concepts to us as humans. You have the entertainment industry, um, which is uh, just for the sake of those who maybe can't read how small this is, I apologize. Um, the, this smell is the entertainment industry shares rise following the premiere of the mass destruction weapon documentary. Um, so we have the concepts of the entertainment industry, obviously, um, movies. We have stocks rising, we have this mass destruct, weapons of mass destruction concept that's modifying a documentary. And we see that when we look at the neurons that fire in response to this, this new input, we have strongly detected the weapons of mass destruction. Um, it seems that, that the, the network has very strongly learned to focus on that part of the smell. Um, you have the stock market, value and currency, um, housing, oil, Bitcoin, right? All these valuable things associated with the stock market. Um, we have biology, biological and a chemical neuron, right? It's chemistry, half nuclear, uh, amino, right? Acids, weapons, like these, these are, it's learning the concepts that kind of belong to this input. Um, and so what we've done is we've essentially learned weights where every single synapse, which is represented by a row of the original weight matrix, Every single synapse has learned its own concept from the corpus we fed it. Um, we learn generation, weeks, seasons, years, so some concept of time, um, Europe, country, globe, family, border, right? I can click on almost any one of these um, 
and we'll have some kind of concept in our own head that seems to, to match with it. Private, public, equity, sector, insurance, intellectual, pharmaceutical. Um, so, so yeah, just go ahead and play around. You can play around with this yourself and kind of see uh, how interpretable this model is. Uh, it just learns to associate actually conceptually similar things together. Um, and this, these are all the synaptic weights, right? So this is when you pass it through the model and you only select the top, I don't know how many, um, say 32, you have a word embedding all of a sudden for this smell or some kind of embedding for this sentence um, where the top activated synapses are ones and the lowest activated ones are zeros um, that uniquely identify the sentence, kind of like a barcode or a hash code for uh, every smell. Um, and we can use this binary representation for, for a lot of different tasks downstream. Um, as shown by the results tables that I showed earlier. So just, just to conclude, um, yeah, we can hack biological algorithms to solve useful tasks in AI. Um, they can, biologically inspired networks certainly can learn useful representations for different NLP tasks, um, like the similarity search and the word embeddings that we talked about earlier. They are more computationally efficient inherently than their non-biological counterparts. One, the model that we took is evolutionarily refined with limited energy. Um, so we expect it to be computationally efficient. Uh, we need to find a way to learn that doesn't require super, huh, super computers across different clusters, right? Um, so this is, this is another big plus of this model. Um, and finally, uh, as shown by the demo, every single feature that's learned, every single bit that's turned on or off kind of represents the presence or absence of a particular concept given, given I, I keep using the word smell, but given a phrase or a word with context, right? Um, so these are the three big things that uh, I wanted to emphasize in this talk. I hope it was enjoyable to you guys and also informative. Um, I think Dima and I would love to take whatever questions you guys have now after, yeah, until it's time to go.